studying or reading chapter 7, we'll do verses 1 through 6. Uh, the first two verses is kind of a narrative segue into a new form of action. I could have broke that up into two sermons, but I think we can pack that all into one. <laughs> chapter 7, verse number 1, the men of Kiriath Jermaine came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark from that from the day that the ark remained in Kirijim, the time was long. It was twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Twenty years passed. Then, verse number three, Samuel spoke to the house of the Lord, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Asherah from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Asherah and served the Lord alone. Then Samuel said, Gather all of Israel to Mizpah. I will pray to the Lord for you. They gathered a bit of water, poured it out before the Lord, fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mitzvah. Since chapter 3, we haven't heard much about Samuel, have we? Last time we saw him, he was just a little fella hearing from the Lord for the first time. Obviously, the events that took place in chapters 4 through 6 that we've been studying for the last couple weeks, the battle with the Philistines and the loss of the ark, that all took place when Samuel was just a young fellow. He, he would have had no influence over Eli's sons, and he would have had no influence over the nation. We did learn that the word of the Lord had returned, uh, and God was speaking to him. It's just going to take some time for young Samuel to grow up and to gain influence with the nation. So chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, the narrator gives us a detail that helps us in this transition time. The ark goes to Kiriad during and stays there how long? 20 years. They had to get it out of Beshemesh, as we learned, but they didn't take it back to Shiloh, where it originally was. Why not? Wasn't that where the tabernacle was? doesn't tell us in 1 Samuel, but when you look at other passages, it, the scripture Old Testament implies that Shiloh quite possibly had been destroyed. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 78, verse 60 63, he had abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent that he set up among humans. He sent the ark of his might, he sent the ark of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was furious with his inheritance. Fire consumed their young men, and their young men women had no wedding songs. So here is a psalm lamenting what happened at Shiloh. Also, a narrative passage, Jeremiah chapter 26. Uh, the folks were uh, saying to Jeremiah, Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like? Shiloh, and that the city will be desolate and deserted. Possibly Shiloh was destroyed completely by the Philistines, but we know specifically God's presence had abandoned Shiloh. The name of the Lord, the name of Shiloh was now synonymous with desolation and desertion. And the word that was the name that was given was Ichabod, meaning the glory had departed. So Shiloh used to have a reputation of being where you were in the presence of God. Now it has a reputation of being a desolate place. Reputations are important things to guard. You can work long and hard to gain a good reputation, only to lose it in a moment of indiscretion. So many times I'm typing on Facebook what I think is a funny comment. Ha ha ha, Eric will think this is hilarious. And then I delete, 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 delete it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, Eric might think it's funny, and my friends would get it. But all these other people that read it, maybe won't think it's so funny and will not get the joke and get the wrong impression of me. Many times I've warned my sons, be careful what you type or post. Once it gets out there in public domain, you can't pull that stuff back. Can you? It's now out there for all time. 
eternity. But really, for the most part, it's not that moment of thoughtless indiscretion that gets us in trouble. That's really more the Hollywood plot, that you know, you're not really a bad person, you just kind of accidentally ended up at the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and it looks bad and worse than it really is, you know, oops, I got caught, didn't need to. No, no. The reality is we're a whole lot worse than we look, aren't we? We clean up pretty good, we can appear like we're doing okay, but in reality we are much more like this iceberg, right? Where what you see on the surface is a whole lot more underneath, isn't there? What I show you in one little bit of my sin you do see, there's probably 90% more of it that people don't get to see. So I'm way worse than I get caught for. Jesus said in Luke 6.45, a good man brings good things out of a good that is stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil that's stored in his heart. <coughs> For the mouth speaks what the heart is full. We can pretend to be innocent bystanders, victims, oh, people took me the wrong way, oh, I was misunderstood, oh, I got prejudged, but the truth is, we're full of it. We're full of sin. Uh, probably we've earned our bad reputations, quite honestly. Just being honest with y'all, you know, back in college, I used to be called into the dean's office a fair bit. It was on the dean's list. This wasn't that list. <laughs> <laughs> and the one thing he was pulling me in for, I never knew, because there was always like, I was going through my mind. It's like, what were things he could be wanting to talk to me about? I'm not really sure which one I got to talk to today, you know? So I'd be like, Oh, you want to talk to me about not doing my dorm job? Oh, good. For a minute, I thought you were going to talk to me about, you know, toilet paper in the girls' dorm out after curfew or something like that. Well, that's not such a big deal, I guess. You know, and I always walked away from that office thinking, well, this didn't go as bad as it could have been. <laughs> that's a very PG illustration, but you get my point. I don't think I need to get any more graphic for you to agree with my iceberg analogy, right? The mouth speaks of what the heart is full of. This is why we have to be constantly renewing our minds with the Word of God and with the company we keep. If all we see and hear is foolishness, and all we are around is foolish people who talk godlessness and wickedness, then pretty soon that's what will spill out of our hearts and out of our mouths and out of our lives is godlessness and wickedness. Shiloh didn't get its reputation of being godless overnight. God didn't decide to vacate on a whim. On the contrary, he is long-suffering. He is slow to wrath. And Eli's sons had the reputation of being godless for a long time before the glory of God finally departed. So the ark was never going back to Shiloh. It was placed at kiriath Jerim at Abinadab's house, and Eliezer, his son, was consecrated to attend to it. Eliezer is a common Old Testament priest's name, so no doubt these folks were Levites and were qualified to attend to the ark, and it has been there in his living room for 20 years. During these 20 years, Israel has not done very well. The Philistines have been dominating them. <coughs> Even though God illustrated to the whole Raiders of the Lost Ark story through verses chapters 5 and 6 that he had dominion over the Philistines, nevertheless, God wasn't helping Israel conquer them. He beat them up by himself personally, but he was not giving them the victory. And there was no peace in the land. And like we learned last week, God is not on their side. God, what we say, God is. God is. And Israel needed to get where God is and do what God wanted them to do in order to be best blessed by God, in order to have restored prosperity. They needed to do it His way. How's the last year has been for you guys? Well, not too good. We're constantly at war. We lack leadership. And the Philistines are dominating us. 
It says in verse 2, all the house of Israel, what? Lamented after the Lord. So it's 20 years of lamentation. Sometimes it's good to step back and review. To do a history lesson. Even if you don't like history, it's good to do a history lesson. It's good to evaluate the situation. How's the last 20 years been for the country? I did a little review this week, and I made a overhead for it. I went back actually 21 years because I felt like uh, the LA riots was kind of a big deal. 1992, you had the LA riots. 93, you had the World Trade Center bombing for the first time. Killed a bunch of people in that. Plus, in 93, there was Waco. 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing took place. In 96, we had the uh, attack in, uh, and some of our military personnel died in Saudi Arabia by Islamic terrorists. Plus, also that same year, we had the Olympics in Atlanta, and we had a bombing at that Olympics. 1998, of course, we had the one. We had two attacks in 1998 on uh, U.S. embassies in Africa, and over 224 were injured, 4,500 were injured, 224 were killed. 1999, folks, you remember the Columbine school shooting? That was horrific. 2001, of course, 9 11, we don't even have to describe it, we just say 9 11. 2002, how many were here around D.C.? You were at, that's right, remember that? Cyber, Hurricane Katrina. We've had the various shootings, the Amish school shooting, that was terrible. Virginia Tech, we've had the collapse in the economy with the bailouts, all that money. Uh, the BP oil spill in the last two years, we've had the Benghazi cover up. We had the attack on our embassy, we've had hurricanes, we've had movie shootings, we've had uh, Sandy Hook, another elementary school. We had this year, half a year, we've already had the Boston City bombing and all of these scandals with our leadership. 26 million babies have been aborted in the last 20 years. Over 57,000 servicemen have been died or injured in war in the last 12 years. And our government is passing laws that legalize things that God calls an abomination. Now for me personally, the last 20 years have not been that bad. I graduated from college, I went into the ministry, I got married, I had three kids, I graduated some more, I came down to Maryland, I pastored a faith Bible church. So I don't have a lot of complaints, but I didn't lose my child at war, did I? My home didn't get destroyed by a tornado or a hurricane. My children didn't get shot up in their school. Same would be true for Israel. Lots of individuals would have had a good time in the last 20 years, some personal success. But as a nation, are we succeeding? Are they suffering? I look at our nation and I would say that we have decayed morale, morality. We have decayed morality. As a result, we have a decaying society. This is not a happy Father's Day topic. But the reality is like chapter 7, verse 2. We, too, have a lot to lament. We ought not to be happy about all this. We ought not to be apathetic and say, oh, well, it doesn't affect me as long as my Internet's working and I'm still getting a paycheck. Well, I'm fine. If we wait until it does affect us to care, it may be a whole lot worse. Then again, maybe a whole lot worse is what needs to happen before people will return to the world. This is the root problem for Israel. It's been 20 years and maybe even longer since people served God alone. Since the people obeyed the Lord. Verse number 3, Samuel spoke to the house of Israel saying, If you will return to the Lord with all your hearts and remove the foreign gods, the Ashtaroth from among you, direct your hearts to the Lord and serve Him alone, He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So, the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served the Lord alone. There's the problem. Samuel has put his finger on it. You have to remove the four gods. You have to direct your heart to God. And you have to serve Him alone. You have to remove the Ashtaroth, he says. The female goddess of sex and war. Remove the Baals. 
the fertility gods. What kind of gods are these? These are Canaanite gods, aren't they? These are a religion that glorified promiscuity and fornication. That's what these gods did. That was their, their theology. And that's what they did when they worshipped them. Basically, everything opposite to what the true living God said was good, they did the opposite in this religion, this false religion. The absolute lack of moral character in the Canaanite gods made such corrupt practices as ritual prostitution, both male and female, and child sacrifices, the normal expression of religious devotion. That was their concept of good. That was their concept of spiritual. You went to church, sacrificed your kid, and you did all that stuff. That's what they did. You know what's bizarre? Sexual immorality is defended in our culture as freedom of speech and gay rights. Child sacrifices is defended in our culture as women's rights. In our culture, we're doing the exact same stuff. We don't do it in the name of Ashkeroth or Baal. We do it in the name of freedom, in the name of individual rights. And in our country, once an immoral activity gets tagged as someone's individual rights or freedoms, people will religiously defend it because individual rights and freedoms have become the ultimate definition of good. But when what you say is good is the opposite of what the creator of the universe says is good, well, both can't be right. If I tell you what God says and you say, well, that's hate speech, both can't be right. Now we're seeing the big picture as to why 34,000 Israelites died in that battle against the Philistines and why God slaughtered 50,000 Israelites at Beth Shemesh. Now we understand why the nation put up with Eli's immoral sons serving in the temple. Why? Because they were all guilty of these pagan sacrifices and these pagan practices. Like I said last week, Israel wasn't good and the Philistines bad. God is good and Israel has deviated away from him. According to their actions, they fit better with the Philistines and with the Canaanites. And Samuel has now shone the light on this thing. And he says, we've got to go to Mitzvah. Everyone's got to meet me at Mitzvah. Gather Israel together at Mitzvah and I will pray to the Lord for you. Mitzvah is interesting because the word means watchtower. The root Hebrew word safa conveys the idea of being fully aware of a situation in order to gain advantage and keep from being surprised by one's enemy. That's what you do in a watchtower, right? You'd be out there looking around and you'd be fully aware of your surroundings so you can see the enemy sneaking up on you. That's what it means to be fully aware of a situation. Think about that for a moment. Why all this pain and destruction? Why all this corruption and godlessness in our country? Why is our society, our culture in decay? It's because the people who are supposed to be the brightest and the best, the people who are supposed to be leading us wisely, are not, are not fully aware of the situation. Even though the government is obsessing about security and gathering information and data on everyone to be better informed, they're not fully aware of the situation. Because a huge piece of the puzzle they refuse to acknowledge even exists. A huge piece of the puzzle that they refuse to acknowledge exists is that people are worshipping false gods. And these gods are not able to heal, help, or save. People do not want to remove the foreign gods or direct their hearts to the Lord or serve Him alone. They want to serve their gods of money and science and self. They want to worship fame and beauty, celebrity and human ingenuity. They want to hoard and practice hedonism. We call it our individual rights and freedoms. God calls it sin. Amen. And we won't bless it. We need the nation to come to Mitzvah. We need to come to the place where we are fully aware of the situation. Then and only then can we deal with the problems and gain the advantage. 
over our enemies. Until that happens, we're just going to keep throwing money at these problems, trying the same old failed policies. Well, let's just get more education. Well, we need community organization. Well, we need a stronger military. We need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to lower the interest rates. We need to raise the taxes. No, we need to lower the taxes. We need more government. No, we need less government. And we'll just keep doing the same things over and over again until the money rains up. Oh, wait, it already has. Well, let's just raise the debt ceiling and just print some more because that'll work, right? Since it's Father's Day, Let's listen to our founding fathers, shall we, on this situation. Benjamin Franklin said, Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become more corrupt and vicious, they have more need of disasters. Means you've got to be enslaved. Virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor, my friend. And this alone that renders us invincible. These are the tactics we should study. If we lose these, we are conquered, fallen indeed. So long as our mayors and principles remain sound, there is no danger. Patrick Henry, let's do a few more. It's pretty good. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to go the government of any of them. Listen to Noah Webster. This is Prophecy. I mean, you're talking prophecy here. If the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled people in office, <laughs> the government will soon be corrupted. Laws will be made not for public good so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or incompetent men will be appointed to execute the laws. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men, and the rights of citizens will be violated. And this Regardless, did the dads have something there? <laughs> hmm. Our founding fathers were fully aware of what the nation needed to be moral, to be virtuous. Here is the foundation for morality. Direct your heart to God. Serve Him alone. It's an old-fashioned word, but I think it's one we ought to start asking God for. Revive. Revive. And it has to start with you. You have to put away your sin. You have to stop endorsing and supporting false gods. You have to direct your heart to God and serve Him alone. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. Whatever is taking God's rightful place in your life, whatever is preventing you from following Him wholeheartedly, that needs to go. If it is immoral living, fornication, you need to quit it. If it is a lack of self-control, you're letting sin in the form of addiction have dominion over you, you need to forsake it. If it's hatred or bitterness or fear, you need to rebuke those spirits. If it's greed or coveting, you need to confess that. And of course, none of this will ever happen if we don't first and foremost break the power of pride. Humble ourselves, pray, and repent, as they did at Mitzvah. In verse number 5, Samuel said, I will pray for you. They gathered at Mitzvah, verse 6. They drew water. They poured it unto the Lord. They fasted that day, and they said there, We have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned. The water symbolizes what? We do that up here on the stage from time to time. Repentance, washing, cleansing. Fasting communicates an earnest desperation. It, it communicates, I really, really need this. People don't fast for fun. Have you ever just fasted for the fun of it? Like, man, I just feel like deprived myself of food for a while. Uh, people only fast when they're serious. You fast when you need an answer, when you need some intervention. You think about it for a minute, how much of our day revolves around mealtime, right? We have a multi-billion dollar fast food industry, and even in Samuel's day, everything revolved around food. All the seasons, everything you went through, whether it was planting or harvesting time, your livestock, all your day-to-day -day chores revolved around feeding your family. Because food's just an absolute necessity for life. But to fast communicates, I need God more than I need food. I need God for life more than I need anything else. Him hearing my prayers is more important than my daily need to eat. They gathered at Mitzvah. 
meaning they were making themselves fully aware of the situation. They know what they need to do in order to gain the advantage over the Philistines. They know what the problem, what the root of the problem is. They have to get rid of the false gods, the Baals and the Astros. They have to direct their heart to the Lord. They have to repent. They have to say, we have sinned against the Lord. And then one final observation in verse 6. What was the one final action that took place? Samuel judged the sons of Israel. <coughs> What that means is basically Samuel is now the leader. He's probably not much older than 30 at this point, but he's now the judge. He's now in charge, which is so very important and crucial. Because while we, want, we know one thing about Samuel is what? The word of the Lord was this Samuel. And now Israel has someone who's following God's word, leading this. Finally, they have someone with God's word. Wouldn't that be great? They have leaders who follow God's word. And what we will see next week is the change that that makes for the nation. But we know that 20 years of Baal and Ashtaroth have resulted in failure and oppression for Israel. I guess it only makes sense to try something else, doesn't it? You know? Definition for insanity. You know what that is? We're the same thing over and over. What I was hoping today was to provide you with a mitzvah to make you fully aware of what's going on and to offer you a new direction for some of you a renewal for some of you revival to return to the right path and if we would do it personally and then we would live it out in an influential manner then maybe we could get a full blown revival in our nation that we could return to virtue and morality and the word of God to solve our nation's problems I've been meeting with a group of pastors and for a couple months now, and one of the fellas has directed us towards OneCry. I'm giving you the website up here on the slides, OneCry.com. OneCry, and you can look it up, is a program that is trying to motivate people to pray. What a, what a big concept. Shocking, really. Pray for spiritual awakening. It's a program that promotes praying for revival, but not revival in the sense that we want to host a meeting or an event or weekend activity. No, personal revival, not for a weekend, but for a life, for a lifelong commitment to revival. And when I look at our land, I would say that we need it. And I don't think our country's leaders are going to do it anytime soon. We're going to need to do it ourselves. It's going to need to start with me, and it's going to need to start with you. We need to become fully aware of the situation. We need to direct our hearts to the Lord. We need to not settle for immorality. We need to raise the standard of righteousness once again. We need to let God and God's word change us. Father, we thank you so much for the foundation we received from the founding fathers of this nation. Lord, help us to Review them and renew them. Lord, help us to pray each and every soul in here for a personal revival. To direct ourselves wholly to the Lord. And let you direct us to follow you. Not being double-minded. Not having two masters. To not settle for sin and injustice and godlessness and support it, and endorse it, and vote for it. Help us to raise the standard up once again. Help us to honor you. Help us to be aware of our situations. And help us to be renewed. Revive us once again, we pray, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Everyone, please rise and close the service with Venus Center.